Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, good evening, it's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. The Independent Review of Social Cohesion has been published, and it is a damning assessment of multicultural Britain. Integration has failed, but we cannot solve the threat to our way of life by abandoning our way of life. The Chinese Communists have attacked the heart of British democracy as the government points the finger at the Chinese Communist Party for a cyber-attack on the Electoral Commission, which gave it access to 40 million British people's personal details. The Green Agenda may have pushed Britain to the brink of empty shelves and food shortages as British farmers are having their arms twisted into turning crop fields into environmental and wildlife projects. Plus, as the Princess of Wales announces her worrying diagnosis of cancer, I'll be giving my view on the endless conspiracies we have seen in the past few months. As someone who once sat at the Cabinet table and oversaw a department, I can assure you that governments are seldom so organised or clever enough to execute any sort of conspiracy whatsoever. State of the Nation starts now. We'll be joined by my most mogulicious panel, former Brexit Party MEP and birthday girl, Annunciata Rees-Mogg, and the author and broadcaster, Amy Nicole Turner. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's your favourite time of the day, the news from Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thank you, and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight. The Deputy Prime Minister today in the Commons accused China of being responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting the Electoral Commission. Databases containing the names and addresses of 40 million registered voters were visible to Chinese hackers in 2021 and 2022, but the government says it didn't affect the outcome of local elections at the time. Oliver Dowden said that national cyber security support will help political parties make sure they're protected from foreign influence in the run-up to the general election. We want now to be as open as possible with the House and with the British public, because part of our defence is calling out this behaviour. This is the latest in a clear pattern of hostile activity originating in China, including the targeting of democratic institutions and parliamentarians in the United Kingdom and beyond. Oliver Dowden. Now, the Conservative Party is facing another by-election in a red wall seat. 
After Scott Benton resigned, the Blackpool South MP was already facing a recall petition. Mr Benton, who's now running as an independent, was found to have broken Commons rules when he was caught out in a sting by the Times newspaper offering to act on behalf of gambling investors. Shadow Paymaster General Jonathan Ashworth says his resignation has come too late. He should have done it much sooner, frankly, and the Tory party should have made him resign much sooner. I mean, it's absolutely chaos, isn't it, in the Tory party today? A divided party, from, divided from top to bottom, and weak leadership under Rishi Sunak. We need this by-election now as soon as possible. The Tories should move the writ and let's get on and let, let's elect a Labour MP who can represent the people of Blackpool here in the House of Commons. Jonathan Ashworth. Now, protest groups Save British Farming and Fairness for Farmers of Kent have driven their tractors into central London tonight to protest about substandard imports and the dishonest labelling of food. They're also protesting against low-cost agricultural imports, saying it all amounts to a threat to food security. And it comes after Europe's farmers ramped up their demonstrations across the continent, protesting against EU and national measures. Sarah, Duchess of York, says she's full of admiration for the Princess of Wales after her can cancer announcement. Posting on social media, the Duchess said she hopes Kate will now be given the time, space and privacy to heal. The Duchess added, I know she'll be surrounded by the love of her family and everyone is praying for the best outcome. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. The government's independent review of social cohesion has been released. It's written by Dame Sarah Khan, who had a piece in today's Telegraph, which opened as follows with a rather tinted spectacle view of our history. Britain's strength lies in its richly diverse and cohesive democracy, built on centuries' hard-won rights, our commitment to individual liberty, equality and democratic freedoms form the bedrock of our nation. Unfortunately, this is fatuous nonsense. Until recently, our democracy was not diverse, and it's never been cohesive. Democracy requires a variety of strongly held views, and our constitution has been vigorously challenged. The strength of our constitution lies in its adaptability, and it survived serious challenges over centuries. Just going back to the 17th century and not earlier, there was a civil war, a restoration, and a glorious revolution in 1642, 1660, and 1689, respectively. In the relatively peaceful 18th century, there were rebellions in 1715, 1745, and the French Revolution in 1789 was thought likely to topple the whole British system, and some traitors, like Charles James Fox, were in favour of doing so. In the apparently calm 19th century, there was the Cato Street conspiracy to murder the whole of the Cabinet in 1820, while there were eight assassination attempts on Queen Victoria. This was in a peaceful time. There was the Chartist March in 1848, when a petition was signed by two million people demanding a complete change in our constitution. 80,000 special constables were put on the streets, the Queen was removed to the Isle of Wight, and it all passed off peacefully. In 1926, there was a general strike that looked to topple the government, and Arthur Scargill in 1984-5 led a minor strike trying to do the same. And this is without mentioning the IRA. So this idea that we've been cohesive and charming all the way through is the milksop view of the Constitution. And this report also produces some potty statistics that are meant to worry us into abandoning some of our freedoms. It proposes that 13% of a subgroup polled had to move house because of freedom-restricting harassment FRH, which makes it sound wonderfully technical. This means two and a quarter million people have moved house because they're frightened of their own opinions. If this were true, it would represent about a quarter of all annual house moves in the UK, which just seems self-evidently improbable. What is closer to the truth is that there are some cases when freedom of speech borders on intimidation, and this should not be, and indeed is not, lawful, and the police should protect people for the opinions they wish to express. It should not be used as a major clampdown on freedom of speech and stopping protest near schools. We have seen what happens when people try to stop peaceful prayer outside abortion clinics. It leads to an extraordinary overreaction by the police and invents thought crimes. The other recommendation, to reinforce the Equality Act's public sector equality duty to, quote, foster good relations between persons who share a relevant protected characteristic and persons who do not share it, 
moves in precisely the wrong direction. The Equality Act is a menace that seeks to segregate communities and divide them away from each other. It would be better to repeal it altogether. It also suggests establishing a fund for the impartial office for social cohesion and democratic resilience. And we do not need another quango or another fund, particularly not an Orwellian one of this kind. These recommendations miss the point. Britain does have a serious social cohesion problem, specifically with respect to the threat of Islamism and its desire to turn Britain into a theocratic state. But the way to combat the threat is not to abandon our democratic traditions of free and vigorous expression with our every move governed by more meddling quangocrats. We resist tyranny by holding true to our values, demonstrating to our enemies that their attempts at intimidation will not succeed, and understanding our history rather than making it up in this vacuous way. As ever, let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. And I'm very pleased to be joined, by, be joined now by Nima Parvini, academic and author of The Populist Delusion. Well, Nima, thank you so much for joining me. Tell me, what is The Populist Delusion? Well, uh, thanks for having me, uh, Jacob. Um, the Populist Delusion is a book, uh, basically, that... Uh, somewhat challenges the outline of history that uh, you've just given, um, namely that uh, processes are bottom-up and democratic in the way that you outline. It takes a more uh, realist view of politics and power, which is something that I think that the current moment is actually teaching us in real time. Um, and uh, in fact, if I if you give my response to the Khan review, it may outline where some of these disagreements about democratic freedoms may uh, lie between us. OK. Uh, and what I would argue about our constitution is that almost all our constitution and developments uh, come about by accident or through conflict. I and mean, if you go right the way back to 1265, um, Simon de Montfort is rowing with the king, and therefore the Burgesses are called to Parliament. It isn't some carefully thought through democratic principle. Uh, likewise, Magna Carta is a row between the king and, mm. and the barons, and that we have developed in this way, but not because anyone sat down and thought it through. No, no I mean, it, uh, essentially, my view is that the, uh, the history of any country is a history of its elites and history of essentially uh, rival elite factions. Um, the the issue that I have really with, I mean, your history lesson was very interesting, uh, Jacob, and I listened intently, but the, the idea that the nation is built on democratic freedom, I think is a little far-fetched. Uh, as far as I can see, there has never been any time in history when the ideal of free speech has been achieved. Uh, even if one abolishes religion, one can never abolish political theology, which has a tendency towards absolutism. Um, free speech tends to be reserved for the friends of those in power and restricted for the enemies of those in power. Uh, you mentioned the French Revolution. I mean, you can look at what happened there. Um, Edmund Burke famously tried to ban Thomas Paine's Rights of Man. Uh, our minds instinctively turn to the mass book burnings in mid-century Germany, but it's often forgotten that the Allies uh, also had thousands of German books pulped, and they even had the typesets of the printing presses melted down. During the Cold War, you could not be an open Soviet sympathizer, which is one reason why the left during that time advocated for free speech. People forget that once upon a time, the left ruled for free speech. Uh, now, of course, the left is in power everywhere, even as the Tories nominally hold government. And so, of course, conservative opinions are banned. And uh, if I may be frank, uh, Jacob, one of the issues is that nominally conservative institutions, such as the Tory party, refuse to play friend-enemy. They routinely throw people who should be their friends under the bus and end up bowing to the enemy. Uh, there's one Tory MP, I'm not going to kind of name her, but... Let's just say it's a, a rising Cameronite star. She spent her entire career advocating for gender equality, trans rights, every social justice issue under the sun. Uh, I'm sure the audience of this show understands economics. As far as I can see, this person, this MP I'm talking about, 
is simply responding to incentives, reward and punishment mechanisms. And many people feel that it's the failure of the Conservative Party to wield power for friends and against enemies while in office, um, which is why a lot of people are saying they deserve zero seats in the upcoming election. Because well, we, I, I, uh, yeah. I think you make a very interesting point about how people always want free speech for their side of the argument and try and shut it up for the other side of the argument. Um, I happen to think it's a pity that Russia today got shut down because I think you want to listen to people like that, that Lord Hawhaw broadcasting in the Second World War made Nazi Germany look ridiculous. And if you hear from your opponent, you can often um, lampoon them and you can caricature them very effectively. So I'm very sympathetic to that point. But what do you think about this um, the report, the Khan report? Do you think it's a helpful contribution to the debate? Um, well, I mean, one, one of the issues, and I, I, I hate to say this again, uh, Jacob, is that the, uh, the government over the past two decades, and certainly in the past 14 years, has empowered left-wing activists to behave in the way that the Khan Review outlines with no consequences. I mean, there are certain activist groups, again, I'm sure you know the ones I'm, I'm talking about, who can essentially smear people like me and you um, with you know, cost-free, and there is no legal recourse to come back on these people because, frankly, who's going to, you know, who's going to see where my fight? And it's been made clear that these things are connected because we can read the intelligence reports. So I do on a regular basis. You, you know, uh, when when George Orwell, who you mentioned, wrote 1984, a lot of people thought he was talking about Stalin's Russia, the Soviet Union. He was actually talking about his own experiences in the British Information Research Department. And he was saying back then that Britain in 1948 was at risk of becoming totalitarian yeah, like Russia. Indeed. And, and, he, that's and he called it 1984 because his publisher thought 1948 would be too frightening. On that happy note, thank you very much, Nima. Well, with me now is my panel, former Brexit Party MEP Annunciator Rees Mogg, and the author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Amy, let me come to you first. Do you think this report is a valuable contribution to the debate and that we do need more protections for people who feel intimidated by freedom of speech? Um, can I just pick up on a bit of nonsense he just said there? He said the left are the ones that are trying to clamp down on free speech. You could, but why not I'm answer the question? Sure. Let's move on I just, from... I'm just, I've just thought oh, I was baffled by... It usually is, but let's... Let, well, we are, you, are you in favour of this report? Um, am I in favour of this report? Right. Well, I think this report is unfortunately going to be used as a little bit of a dog whistle against multiculturalism, when I think we need to remember that um, social cohesion is very much a two-way street, um, and social cohesion is about coexisting. Um, I said to Nitsiata in the room, and I think of it like a salad. We're all different, but we all coexist salad, and we all work yeah. together. You know, weird salads, they work together. Ham and... Pineapple, who would have thought? <laughs> it works. You know, and it's a two-way street, so it's about supporting um, to cultures to be able to integrate with things like language, the, the... translations, um, with people meeting people. Um, something you missed in your history lesson was empire. Okay, That's come quite on, a big role Absolute key in word multiculturalism. There was cohesion, that in a salad you have a dressing, something that brings everything together and, that can be and which has a common cause. The common cause in our country should be our nation's set of beliefs and principles upon which we all behave. And what we have accidentally done, and I do believe it's accidental, is to create totally separate communities who do not integrate, who do not interact. So you're very sympathetic to the report. And that is causing you... the big problem. My big issue with the report... But you're broadly sympathetic to the report. ..is that the answer to that is not prohibition. So you think it sets out the problem and then comes to the wrong answer? Absolutely. It doesn't provide the salad dressing? Yeah. I'd be but put off this whole report. <laughs> you hate salad. I hate salad. I'm not having anything to do with salad. The, the government has a responsibility, particularly when they're inviting people from other cultures and other countries to come and live and work here, to provide so help and assistance with social cohesion, which over the last 14 years just hasn't been there. I mean, back to Trevor Phillips. I mean, what was it, in the 90s? Uh, early thousands, identifying that the problem with multiculturalism was that it didn't actually mean integrating. It meant keeping people segregated and that that fundamentally will never work. And what we do need to do is to, as the British always have, welcome people into our society, 
and for them to adapt to our set of ways of life. But what are they? And I mean, that is where said, the problem is. That we have people who've been here 40 years who can't speak any English. Now... Yeah, but that was true of the Norman Conquerors. They stuck into Norman well, French for made, quite a long time. I they think, made us speak French. Surely well, everyone, we adapted French. everyone will always maintain that we have a lot more in common than we have differences, and that's a point that we need to take forward well, rather than constantly right. perpetuating this fear of the other, which gets us nowhere. All right, we well, need to on that happy note, <laughs> coming up... As the Chinese communist cyber attack marks the latest chapter of Cold War II, surely it's time to review our relationship with the Eastern superpower. Plus, as the Princess of Wales leaves the conspiracy theorist speechless, I'll be giving you my insider view on the feasibility of government conspiracy theories. Everything from fake moon landings to vaccine microchips. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition and the Golden Chippy is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant and for years they've been serving the community here in Greenwich and even today on a Sunday, they are fully packed today. But this is the issue. Here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal. Residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area. Here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say. What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other feet you've got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so they want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say... It's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals, so he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular, and not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, the mail mogs have been steaming in as we were discussing social cohesion and free speech. Um, Peter says, integration has failed because we have faith schools. Did we not learn anything from the troubles in Northern Ireland? We will gradually get integration if all schools become secular. No, Peter, I don't agree with that. Um, I, I think that church schools are enormously helpful and recognise we are, in fact, still a Christian country. Anthony, Jacob, your mogalog, brilliant as always, thank you. But Charles James Fox was not the rebel you suggest. He was the son of Lord Holland, who paid off his debts. Indeed, he kept on racking up debts. And in 1782, became England's first foreign secretary in the Marcus of Rockingham's second ministry. My, in 1782, my wife's directly is, is a collateral descendant of Rockingham. He didn't have any children. Um, but 1782 is before 1789. After 1789, he is, to my mind, just like Oswald Mosley. He's basically a traitor uh, and unforgivable for the view 
he took of the French Revolution and his desire to overthrow um, the British government and our system and his opposition to Pitt. But there we go. We will devote a programme to that at some point if I get it past the censors. Uh, last year, it was revealed the Electoral Commission was hacked in 2021 with as many as 40 million people's personal details being accessed. It has also been revealed by the US Department of Justice that 43 parliamentary emails were targeted in the attack. But today's news has revealed that the perpetrators are the Chinese communists of Peking, with Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden addressing Parliament on the matter earlier. The Prime Minister has said China represents an epoch-defining challenge, particularly with respect to national security. But surely it's time to reassess our relationship with this superpower, and the rather wet response from this government simply doesn't meet the seriousness of the threat. Well, my panel is still with me, Nunziata Rees Mogg and Amy Nicole Turner. Um, Nunziata, you're re wearing communist red, but I hope that doesn't show any sympathies. Uh, and somewhere or other, I have a copy of the Red Book uh, bought in China. But um, that doesn't mean I follow their beliefs, and I think this is genuinely worrying. And we have been hearing stories recently, not only about hacking into uh, these particular email uh, contacts, uh, the electoral lists, but electric cars that can be switched off from Beijing. That we had Dominic Raab resign ultimately um, over the problems with mobile phone masts and 5G technology. That I think this is a real concern. But we've got to be a mature democracy, as we are, and realise that they are an immense trading partner and work out how to handle it diplomatically without. OK, I've never off. known Nunziata sit so firmly on the fence. It's very unlike that. <laughs> Amy, come on, you never sit on the fence. I have to say that I completely agree with those two points that you made. Because, but I think as we are in an election year, we shouldn't underestimate the interference and the effects that it could have. Because I was looking today at the the scale and the resources of the interference so far, and this is a real threat to our yeah. whole democracy. Um the the interference in universities, some of the technology that well, they're is... buying up places in Cambridge, pretty much giving them millions of pounds to say nice things about examples China. Examples of this soft power that China uses, um, but then we've got ourselves into a situation where we're economically yeah. dependent in many ways on our relationship with China. But then we've so... got to make ourselves economically independent, haven't we? And we, we've got to be tough. We, we cannot just allow China once again to win. What have we done today? We've sanctioned two people and one business yeah, when they've hacked 40 million people plus 43 parliamentary emails. Why aren't we chucking out people from the embassy who are involved in this spike? That's what we did to Russia over the Novacek attempt. We surely want to try for diplomacy over but aggression in failed. light of the security threat, because I think when there's been examples of other nations... Such as Australia, with, with this report, I, I think the government own. said, we've known about this quite a while, but we've got to a point where we have got to make it public because it is such a severe but threat. Then, but then they haven't taken the action to back that up. And I, I diplomacy is a, a mixture of talking and taking action, and it's the taking action we have the not done. The action we are currently taking is performing the kowtow to yeah. the emperor with our nose touching yes. the ground. They have completely failed to deliver on the joint declaration with Hong Kong. They hold Jimmy Lai, a British citizen, in prison <laughs> because he's spoken out, as he was allowed to do. Oh. They spy on British members of parliament, and we sit idly by. Uh, uh, and I just we, don't think this uh, is good uh, Instead of sitting idly by... We say we'll give a few visas to the good people of Hong Kong to whom we should have given citizenship in the first we place. We should have done, indeed. Uh, and that was a complete mobile, moral aberration on our behalf um, that I, uh, should never have happened in 1997. We should have stuck by the people of Hong Kong. We should stick by the good people uh, within China now that there are a number, but they are being quashed by the Communist Party. And we can't accept talking to tyrants unless they'll actually come to an agreement. And I think you do have to, for financial reasons, have those lines of communication open, that they are now a huge economy. But we need to be making ourselves independent of China as far as we can. That if they want to sell us cheap goods, that's fine. 
but we really don't want them manufacturing all our cars that they can then apparently switch off. It just feels too far gone for so that just... now, doesn't it? But then again, we're the stepping stone to the US, perhaps, and the US is a stepping stone to us in many ways, and the US have said mm. more strongly that China is a threat, and I think that their government is considering legislation in this area far faster than The US than is getting tougher. So, yeah. yeah, so... and. As they say, when the US sneezes, we catch a cold or whatever. So I feel we will follow suit in that respect. Absolutely. And for all sorts of reasons, we need to build up our own economy and we need growth in the UK economy. And we need to increase our sustainability in terms of uh, security, food uh, and manufacturing. But we're never going to get there 100%. And we do need to buy goods from abroad. And there's got to be a line under which the, you cannot fall. Well, I think and that's, China's. I think Nunziata is right, and we've gone too far. But thank you to my panel. Coming up, do you wonder why every film, play, and museum exhibition comes laden with left-wing Britain-hating lectures these days? Stay with me, and you'll find out exactly how your money, taken from you under threat of imprisonment, is being used to fund a socialist takeover of the arts. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. The rest of this week, well, be prepared for further heavy downpours and temperatures staying around about or a little bit below average. Low pressure is well and truly in control of our weather and will be for the rest of this week. These weather fronts have been making for a pretty soggy day for much of the UK. The rain across Scotland, falling of snow over the hills, that continues in the east through the night. Elsewhere, it does turn a little bit drier. Uh, staying fairly cloudy and um, staying fairly chilly. Temperatures down into single figures, not far off freezing in northern Scotland and small wintry showers coming into the northern and the western isles as we go into Tuesday. Still a bit more snow over the Grampians, although that should ease. Further showers, though, to come on the east coast of Scotland. Central and southern Scotland looking a little bit drier compared to today. It'll be a wetter day, though, for the southeast as that rain moves in through Tuesday and that spreads into the Midlands and rain again for Northern Ireland. But something a bit brighter in the southwest and south wales and for eastern england too some glimmers of sunshine but it is going to feel pretty chilly particularly across scotland where the rain and hill snow continues into wednesday and then elsewhere it's bands of showers moving in be prepared for some heavy downpours on wednesday there will be some brighter spells between the heavy showers a bit of sunshine we'll see temperatures up to double digits but generally feeling cooler in the breeze and plenty more of those heavy showers to come in the run-up to easter GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Well, um, once again, you've been firing in the mail, Moggs, and David says, why start harping on a pointless story about a three-year-old alleged cyber attack? What was affected? And Ursula, no, China must realise it relies on the West for its trade and behave itself or lose the trade. We need to hold them to account. And a special message has come in that says, happy birthday, Mum. I hope Jacob is keeping you entertained with his jokes. Which has more legs, a horse or no horse? With love from Dora... Molly and Wolf. 
And if you want the answer to that joke, it's in a very good 18th century joke book, recently published by my standards, uh, and I might give it to you later on in the programme if I remember. Today, farmers protested in Westminster, rallying against what they have claimed to be declining food standards from foreign food imports, which pose a threat to their business. However, the real threat to farmers, and what they ought to be protesting about, are the environmental regulations that could be pushing Britain to the brink of food shortages in a classic case of outgreening the green fanatics of Brussels in the post-Brexit era, we are wasting our opportunities to unleash Britain's agricultural competitiveness. Regrettably, we have implemented a sustainable farming incentive, which sounds delightful, but what it really means is twisting farmers' arms to take agricultural fields out of food production and into wildlife schemes. If British farmers want to remain competitive in a global market, they need to produce food at competitive prices. And that's not going to happen if we're incentivising them to turn wheat fields into bogs and marshes. So we're joined now by Neil Parrish. Um, Neil, are you, are you there? Excellent. You weren't yeah, on the protest. Yeah, you didn't yeah. drive your tractor up from Somerset. No, my, my tractor probably um, is older, and um, I wouldn't like it to be investigated too much by the Metropolitan Police, I suspect, um, <laughs> in, in the centre of, of London. It may not be a terribly good idea. Right, you might have had to pay the dreaded you, Les. Um, I, mean, I, I, I think British farmers could be globally competitive if they weren't so heavily regulated and if they didn't have environmental regulations trying to put them out of business. But I don't think there's ever a route to success via protectionism. Yeah, I think the tr trouble is, Jacob, that we have um, sort of trying to get farmers to do too many things at once. Um, let's make them all green and, and take land out of production. That's fine until you have one of the wettest winters on record. Um, the crops are poor this year. You can't get your spring crops in. You know, the, um, east of Taunton, uh, Curry Moor is still underwater. I went to Oxford today because I'm doing a podcast on trying to keep the world farming and the country farming. Um, and, you know, lots of very, very wet fields. So, yes, we should, we, you know, we talk about food security but of course everything that the government's come up with so far has reduced production and when I was in Parliament I always warned that I warned George Eustace the then Secretary of State that if everything you do if you actually incentivize farmers not to grow food especially in a difficult time when costs are high cost of production is high um, then farmers are, are going to take the environmental route which is not all wrong but we don't want as much land uh, put into these schemes we're also taking out good land and planting trees where we actually should not be doing it. And of course, we'll land up importing food probably from Brazil, which they probably burnt down the rainforest in order to produce. So for heaven's sake, you know, we need to have some common sense here. Um, and that's why I'm very keen that yes, we can do both, but we need to have food uh, as the as the driving force, and then the environment um, as you know a a part of that. But let's be sure that food security is what we need. Bread, you know, bread making wheat, all of these things, oilseed rape, for instance. You know, the the Ukraine you see grows uh, forty percent of the sunflower oil in the world. And so we substitute that with rapeseed oil in this country. And of course, there'll be a lot less rapeseed grown. And so all of these things means that we are, you know, importing more food. And as you quite rightly say, competitiveness, you see, I mean, we as a, as, you know, as a conservative government, we seem to have lost all the competitive edge, don't we? That's the problem. Absolutely right. And volume, um, increase in supply, produces more income for farmers if they, if they sell more. And there also seems to me to be a naivety in the environmentalist argument that seems to think that the countryside it was created by nature. It's not. It's created by farmers. Our field system may be old, but it's man-made. Yes, and of course, you know, your, your landscape is very much there, especially where you've got a lot of permanent pasture, which, by the way, holds as much carbon in the soil as planting trees until they're at over 20 years old. So that the permanent pasture, um, especially in a lot of the West Country and the West of the country overall, is very good for the environment. Those sheep and those cattle and those dairy cattle are there actually not only grazing the grass and producing good milk and meat, they're also keeping that landscape. People like to walk in the countryside. I mean, if you if you're not careful, if you go too far with the rewilding, um, you will find that you will have you know a lot of 
coarse growth, you, you destroy a lot of the flora that you're trying to save because by grazing and cutting, you have maintained those wildflowers in your, in your meadows. When you let it go too coarse, then it's destroyed. And all of these things need to be taken into consideration. And I can wax lyrical you, all night. You are waxing this. lyrical already. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil. I don't think we'll get too many ramblers going through when Ben Goldsmith's had his way and we've got the wolves back. I think that will keep um, the ramblers at home. Um, but now um, I have a surprise for you. William Shakespeare is not, contrary to popular belief, the world's preeminent dramatist and the greatest writer in the English language. He is not the man whose extraordinary talent for the timeless and the human allows those alive today to understand the lives of those who lived through ages so different to our own. On the contrary, according to an £800,000 taxpayer-funded project, his disproportionate representation in the theatre has simply propagated white, able-bodied, heterosexual, cisgender, male narratives. Government-funded pinko activism, left-wing activism, taking a wrecking ball to British culture appears a persistent problem, does it not? Well, with me now to get to the bottom of this is my distinguished panel, former Brexit Party MEP and Anunciata Rees-Mogg, and the author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Amy, representing the left, right. this is the most awful guff, isn't it? Waste of £800,000 taxpayers' money. It's amazing how every time these subjects come up, you you manage to denigrate and dismantle the arts always. Yeah, because they're doing rubbish. Fundamentally misunderstand what's going on here. This is the Arts and Humanities Council. Is their yeah, job well, cut their to funding. more deeply understand? Cut their funding. Let's have a tax You've cut. already oh, the government Scrap have already cut the funding over the last 14 years, over and over again. Good, this is a sector, this is rubbish. This is a sector that contributes 5% oh, of the economy, makes billions. It is a sector that is so... Yeah. Under you, do you know, this the is, arts this, is important. This is bordering on a fascist argument from you. No, it's because not. Because it's almost... Why don't we just opposite? burn the book? No, it's not. I'm this saying, I'm saying you put on Shakespeare commercially and people go and see it. You put on this sort of junk and you have to have subsidies for it. Uh, because no one wants to watch it. And uh, we've got 1,400 quangos in this country. The arts takes up a large proportion of that. They are not in any way lacking. But the waste of money is not is a waste disgusting. of money. Disgusting. People who are scraping together to get to the end of the month are paying for the privilege of a few middle class people to go and see a play that no one thinks is very just good. Because you just because they like are paying it doesn't for make it a waste of money to be put on walls that some people think is beautiful art but actually the majority really don't appreciate and don't want to be there in the first place but they are being forced to pay for it. These are people who are trying to scrape together their lives, pay for themselves and their children's way of life and they are contributing, being forced to contribute to fancy nonsense that they don't even want to see. How is that justifiable? Calling it fancy nonsense is just a tiny glimpse into how art, little you value art, the art. Well, let, let Amy speak. No, that's, that's my, my so point entirely. It's just that I don't... But I think if it's that any if, good, if, you if just it's any good, it people will watch it commercially. I, I, I think that what I, what I prepared for was a conversation about the Arts and Humanities Council and the, and the projects that they're I'm wasting £800,000. And you're doing what you do, where you pick out something and make it sound absurd, like when you talk about Mickey Mouse degrees, that yeah. type of thing, right? That's, the, that's the line we're going so down. So cut their it's funding. It's absurd to you, but it is not So absurd. you're defending, <laughs> criticising Shakespeare in this way, at £800,000, almost a million pounds taxpayers' cash. Research is used by academics to further more research over years, over, over, over decades, to Th deepen it, and widen look, our awareness and appreciate the arts. It creates jobs. It I grows don't care the economy. If they spend their own money doing this, if they devote their lives to this sort of stuff, and I can then criticise it or not. What I object to is that my constituents, who may be on the minimum wage, have to pay for this rubbish. It's not a waste of money, it's an investment into the but arts. Historically, uh, what's the most beautiful phase of art? In very history. subjective and the Renaissance. Very is, subjective. Okay, subjective, but Banksy. I think <laughs> virtually everyone would agree Banksy that it was money. the most uh, incredible flowering of the arts that has ever been seen. It is called the rebirth for a good reason. And who was it funded by? Patrons, not taxpayers. 
I think it's a government's responsibility to fund it, it, it should be. I'd go broader and I'd say UKRI is a terrible waster of money. But you it's know what? It's £20 billion but... pounds its annual budget and it just squanders money but then when... on um, quangos and pet projects. And this is a big amount of taxpayers' money used badly. Yeah. And no m taxpayers' money should be spent badly. It is rich. It's the duty to taxpayers. If we're going to talk about government waste, this is absolute fiscal peanuts, and you know it. 20 billion isn't. It all adds up. Anyway, thank you to my panel. Coming up next, talk of conspiracy has abounded recently on a variety of topics. Shady deals and agreements behind closed doors and in smoky rooms, that kind of thing. As a former member of government, I know these smoky rooms very well, at least in theory, because the smoking ban means that description is no longer an opposite one. In just three minutes, I'll reveal exactly what goes on in them. On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., a GB News exclusive reveals a new way our broken asylum system could cost the taxpayer millions of pounds. Is our government hiding data on how many migrants are banged up for serious violent and sexual offences? Nigel Farage tees off. Extremists are forcing people to move house, quit their jobs and fear for their lives, a damning new report reveals. Is it time for Britain to fight back? Don't miss Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11pm on GB News. Be there. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, what's going on in Scotland? So they're implementing these draconian hate speech laws, which are going to come in, into force on April the 1st, I kid oh, you not. Ironically, yeah. And then, um, basically, you can go to your local mushroom shop or whatever. Which I didn't know we had mushrooms farms in Scotland no. because people aren't that keen on vegetables up the road. They're, they're um, <laughs> but, <laughs> not even a shiitake. But, um, but you can report a hate crime at these private... Pla but you can do it anonymously, and then the police will, uh, I don't know, unleash the hate monster. I, I don't know what, how this works. What's going on? I think the hate monster... <laughs> <laughs> is mythical, yes. and um, I don't think the hate monster actually exists. What I do think is exists. I'm genuinely really worried about comedy, right? Yeah. Now, believe it or not, some people in Scotland, they're wrong, but they don't like me. Yeah. And I genuinely feel that a lot of time is going to be wasted. You know, if someone yeah. calls you a name in a shop, you probably deserved it, believe me. Um, also, called... comedy can be quite offensive, particularly yours. And I'm not necessarily sure. As I've said on the show before, I remember my mum was worried when we, we, Scotland had decided that all um, residential properties needed special smoke alarms, and my mum was convinced this was to do with the hate crime and that there was a camera in them. And <laughs> I, I, I don't think she's being that paranoid. I mean, Scotland is a kind of nanny state. You know, actually, Hamza Youssef, when he implemented the hate crime bill, put a, a subsection in that which said that they can criminalise you for things you've said in the privacy of your own home. Thankfully, Scotland doesn't have the largest arts festival in the world. Oh, wait. Oh, no, it does. No. It does. It actually does have that. And lots of comedians are up there. Now, we had this before, because if you go back about to, uh, to 2000 and, what was it, 2003, when New Labour were trying to push through their racial and religious hate crime bill, well, the comedians are silent now. Something has completely changed. There's been a gear shift. Oh, I mean, in the Irish hate crime bill, which is, it, it, which is going through at the moment, they actually define hatred as hatred. Brilliant. It's a complete circular definition. Well, yeah, well, absolutely. And that tells me, when something's woolly, that tells me that it's not going to be applied fairly. It's going to be applied so. according to the person applying it. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Well, welcome back. After months of conspiracy theories and vicious speculation, Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales revealed last week that she had been diagnosed with cancer, merely exposing the unpleasant tendency in many to spread malignant lies. What I really want to discuss today was the phenomenon of conspiracy theories themselves. 
with the hope of bringing some insight as someone who once sat at the Cabinet table has overseen a department and been privy to conversations that determine public policy. Whether it's the fake moon landings, that George Bush was behind 9-11, or that MI6 was behind the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, the verdict is this. Governments are chaotically managed, chronically disorganised, and in a constant state of attempting to keep their heads above water. They're simply not able to execute the sort of grand conspiracies of which they are accused. They're not clever enough. So when the next round of speculation unfolds about whoever the unfortunate individual may be, the people who spread unpleasant lies about the Princess of Wales ought to keep this in mind. And frankly, if you believe these conspiracy theories, you ought to have your head examined. Well, with me now is a man who has written all about this on GBNews.com, State of the Nation's very own regular, Nigel Nelson. Nigel, um, the video with the Princess of Wales, her statement, has shown all that was going on on social media, almost all of it, to be vicious lies. Does this give you some hope that the people who have come up with all sorts of conspiracies about the vaccine and so on will finally realise that this is nonsense? Uh, no, <laughs> sadly. I and mean, I think that conspiracy theories have, have always been with us. So you mentioned things like the moon landings, Princess Diana being murdered by MI6. All these things preceded the internet. And what I think happens is that now on social media, you get um, conspiracy theories that then get much more repetition than they used to. And of course, no explanation to challenge them. So I think it actually gets worse rather than better. I mean, COVID is an absolute, is a perfect example that um, I reported on COVID all the way through the, through the pandemic. And there was a very serious question about the vaccines, that if those vaccines had not been safe, um, then we as journalists had a duty to tell the public that. On the, on the other side, if you just repeated the scare stories that were going around, that would have discouraged people from taking the vaccine. And this is why it seems to me it's very important that governments are rigorously honest. So um, the WHO denied that it could possibly have come from China at the very beginning, which turns out not to be certainly untrue, but at least um, arguably untrue. Yes that the government was very honest about the vaccines and about the results that were available and about its success rate. And that helped build confidence. And it seems to me there's sometimes a tendency in government to give blanket reassurances which allows the conspiracy theories to flourish. Yeah, and that's where the media comes in, that, that our job is to actually scrutinise what the government is putting out. Um, and as we both know, the government doesn't always tell you the, the whole truth about things. Um, and this was, an this was a perfect example of that. So I spent most of um, COVID talking to uh, more scientists than I did politicians. And I talked to them on both sides. What I came down to, I'm not medically qualified, um, what I came down to was that the scientists who were saying the vaccine was uh, no less safe than any other vaccine made more sense to me than the ones who were saying that it was dangerous. And that's very important because you were an independent person analysing the information and a trusted source uh, to pass it on. And I find this when constituents write to me that sometimes I get excellent arguments in response from government departments explaining exactly what the real position is and that's very useful in helping to dampen down conspiracy theories. When it's just the broad brush, no, this isn't right, that's when people carry off and go down the rabbit holes. Yes, I think that's right. That the, um, the, the important thing with conspiracy theories is that, first of all, they often do have, have uh, quite persuasive evidence, but the trouble is they ignore all the other evidence that would knock it down. And that's, that's where a conspiracy theory just becomes a complete article of faith. Um, so the people who, who indulge in COVID conspiracies will pluck out of the air uh, any bit of dubious science that backs up their case, completely ignoring the mainstream science that doesn't. And they will use one statistic that shows there's something to worry about without contextualising it against the overall balance of statistics. Yes, uh or and also then deny that the official statistics... So, for instance, if you take the vaccine, um, what the Office of National St uh, Statistics says is that 51 people, as I think of um, about this time last year, had died directly from the vaccine. Now, 150 million jabs were given out, so that's a pretty good, uh, good rate. It, certainly, it's no higher than any other vaccine, and that's, that was what I was being told by the scientists I trusted during the COVID pandemic. And the 
one reason I've always been very suspicious of conspiracy theories is the number of people you would need to know about them uh, who have to keep it quiet and have to be competent at implementing it. And my experience of government is that it leaks on anything of any interest almost Thank immediately. <laughs> well, it makes the life of journalists easier. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and therefore you couldn't keep it secret. But even if you kept it secret, you haven't got enough competent people to run a conspiracy theory of this magnitude. No, I think that's right. And again, you mentioned the moon landings. So we're, we're talking about over a 10-year period of the uh, Apollo project, 400,000 people were involved. If they'd all been beavering away at a movie, I think someone would have come forward. Um, Princess Diana's death is another example. I mean, that the um, what the intelligence services will tell you is that so many people would have had to be involved in an assassination plot. Would they really all have, have um, kept quiet? Would their conscience not have troubled them? Somebody would have come forward. And that kind of, to me, that makes sense. Well, also, Occam's Razor. I thought you mentioned William of Occam. William yep, of Occam. Yep, good man. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that broadly, the simplest answer is usually the correct one. Yes. And there was a drunk driver there who crashed. Yes. So, so it was a tragic accident with Diana. Um, if, we look, if we now come right back to the present day with, with Kate, now that we know her diagnosis of cancer, everything else falls into place. So we know now why William suddenly left a memorial service um, for their, quotes personal reasons. That was the day of the diagnosis. Everything that's happened now does make sense. The important thing is the conspiracy right. theorists understand it. Well, thank you very much. Um, Nigel, God bless the Princess of Wales. Nigel and I will be getting back out of our lizard suits at midnight, but until then, um, we'll get Nigel back and don't forget to visit him at gbnews.com. That's all from me. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's. Patrick, um, are you getting out of your lizard suit or into your lizard suit this evening? I will not be. I will just be uh, doing my show, Jacob, but um, I assume your lizard suit is double-breasted. But um, <laughs> look, I've got a GB News exclusive for you on the way, which is a new way that asylum lawyers are going to take the taxpayer to the cleaners. Is it OK to torture terror suspects like the Russians? And should parents be sending their kids to school wearing nappies? No, they should not. What a ridiculous idea. They might expect the fathers to change them. Um, that's all coming up after the weather. I'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I'm Jacob rees -Mogg. This has been State of the Nation. And the weather in Somerset is increasingly clement, and I'm glad to tell you that my central heating was repaired today, which may not be necessary in the glorious sunshine we're about to have. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. The rest of this week, well, be prepared for further heavy downpours and temperatures staying around about or a little bit below average. Low pressure is well and truly in control of our weather and will be for the rest of this week. These weather fronts have been making for a pretty soggy day for much of the UK. The rain across Scotland, falling of snow over the hills, that continues in the east through the night. Elsewhere, it does turn a little bit drier. Uh, staying fairly cloudy and um, staying fairly chilly. Temperatures down into single figures, not far freezing in northern Scotland and small wintry showers coming into the northern and the western isles as we go into Tuesday. Still a bit more snow over the Grampians, although that should ease. Further showers, though, to come on the east coast of Scotland. Central and southern Scotland looking a little bit drier compared to today. It'll be a wetter day, though, for the southeast as that rain moves in through Tuesday and that spreads into the Midlands and rain again for Northern Ireland. But something a bit brighter in the southwest and south wales and for eastern england too some glimmers of sunshine but it is going to feel pretty chilly particularly across scotland where the rain and hill snow continues into wednesday and then elsewhere it's bands of showers moving in be prepared for some heavy downpours on wednesday there will be some brighter spells between the heavy showers a bit of sunshine we'll see temperatures up to double digits but generally feeling cooler in the breeze and plenty 